And we have, as I said before, we have in India right now, five Lionel Messi's right now, but we don't know where they are and they're not getting the opportunity to showcase that. And that's the sad thing for me is that, you know, they everybody in, in from my expectations in India, they get to a level where maybe 12, 13, 14, and then all of a sudden, A, the parents, the pressure from the parents and the schools is to forget everything and just go down the educational route. We can only have so many accountants, we can only have so many doctors, we can only have so many chartered surveyors or whatever it is. Now there's an opportunity now to, to look at a different way, a holistic way of saying, okay, if you are good at football, let's pursue that, still get your education. Like, like it works in, in Europe, everybody still gets educated. It doesn't all stop you at 15, 16. And, but you don't have to be, for me, you don't have to be a topper. You have to be a reasonable adult, 70%, 75%, whatever it is, to be a functioning adult. But if you've got a skill set, like being a footballer or like being a good musician or like being a good artist, you can still earn a lot more money or equal amounts of money as you could ever do being a doctor or an accountant or a, a chartered surveyor or whatever it is. And this is what I want to try and try and give to the parents. A lot of parents are getting it now, especially in India, because 60% of the population are under 30. So that's an awful lot of people who have had opportunity to look at the internet, have opportunity to look at what it's like in other, in other countries and how they want to be or seem to be doing it. Um, so yeah, that's, and that comes back to the question about why India, because I think it's such a, a broad canvas at the moment to, if they just, from my point of view, if whoever's in the charge, whether it's in the footballing, whether it's the AIFFF or whoever it is, and they put a little bit of thought and a little bit of money uh, into it, it can go an awful long way to, to making sport better. And on the last part of this, I'm sorry to go on, but when India won the World Cup cricket in, in the first time, the euphoria in India was unbelievable. Everybody was happy and jolly. The, probably the work rate went up, the birth rate went up, no doubt. Everything went up. And we've got to get that in the football, in sport. We're seeing it now with uh, badminton. We're getting silver medals. We're getting gold medals in boxing. We're, we're doing all of these things. Sport is vitally important and it's, it's been a major part of my life. And I'm trying to impart that to, to kids going forward and parents also. The VAR Show The one place for your weekly football update. So hello, a very warm welcome to VAR show, the show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail. Today we are going to connect with interviews and we have former Liverpool, Bolton and City player, Mr. Mark Schuster Greaves with us. So without wasting much time, I would like to first thank Mark for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show. And like, I would like to begin thank by you. asking you, how are you and what are you doing these days? I'm very well. Um, I'm obviously still uh, locked up and trying to keep myself safe from COVID. Uh, but no, we're starting to work again. I work for Sony TV um, as a football panelist or a football expert, if you like. And um, we're doing a lot of shows from home. So that's that's nice to be able to get back to work. Was that new? Like I have seen, I have personally seen you a lot also in Sony. I wanted to ask you, like you mentioned one thing before. I move on much more to your career as a footballer also and I want to ask you like nowadays you said like you do much like most of many of your so shows from home compared to before when you on studio what is the big difference for you do you find it a difference yeah absolutely you're on your own here uh, when you're in a studio you've actually got human beings to interact with you know and when we are in the studio it'll be either Terry or Ashley or David and Manas or Arpit as presenters and there's a, it's a better vibe. It's, 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 it's nicer to be, you know, all together and, and work off each other. Whereas when you're here, all you've got is a computer screen in front of you, albeit with all the other guys. But Ashley lives in Sydney. Uh, David lives in England. I live in Goa. Terry lives in Bangalore. And obviously the show's coming direct from, um, from Mumbai. So 
Yeah, but I, I like the fact that when we all get together, we have a, a good chat, a good laugh, and um, it's, it's far more enjoyable being that way than it is being at home. But isn't this more convenient for you, like working from home? Absolutely not. No, I, I, like, I like to get out. And the fact of going to Mumbai from Goa means I have to get a flight. I have to go to Mumbai. I love Mumbai also. I think the place is brilliant. Um, and yeah, I like being able to spend two or three days in Mumbai and then come back to, to Goa. At the moment, um, you know, as much as it sounds really nice to be able to get up out of your bed, to go into the living room or the, or the, the dining room and do it from there, I'd much rather be uh, in Mumbai doing it live. Also, I wanted to ask, like, you know, because of this pandemic, all these new propositions started coming up, like working from home in terms of, you know, like uh, shooting. Do you think going forward, this can have an effect on the future shoots? Or do you think once maybe the pandemic dies down or it, it's a more normal thing all across the world, do you think you, you will go back to the studio shooting more often? Absolutely, because it's when you're in the studio, it's a lot more refined. The lighting's more refined, everything about it. The producers and the directors are desperate for as, as much quality as they can do. From home, it's okay. It's a means to an end at the moment. But um, no, I think they want to have control of the setting. So the lighting has to be really right and the audio has to be right. And, you know, from their point of view, I'm sure they are like me wanting us to get back into the studio. Of course, and I'll ask you, like, you know, like you have been in India for quite a while now and you have been involved in various projects, maybe with TV or maybe even with football. Why India? Uh, yes, exactly the same question I asked myself when I first came here was I came here initially as Arsenal's technical director for grassroots football in, in, in India, which was based in Delhi. Um, and that was it. You know, I, I came over. It was a new challenge. I didn't expect to stay more than the, the contract, which was a two year contract. Um, and I ended up, I've been here eight, nine years. I, I had an Indian business partner. I have an Indian girlfriend. I have an Aadhaar card. I have a PAN card. I am more Indian than, than a lot of Indians that are already here. So I love it. I think it's the land of opportunity for the likes of myself to come here uh, with my qualifications, both as a, a football player, but also I'm, I'm a UA for a licensed coach. And I've coached in, in the Premier League also with, with the likes of Derby and Wigan Athletic. So my, my, um, my qualifications are, are great for, for somewhere like India, where, you know, the grassroots and football in general is not of, of the best standard. So I'm, I'm here to try and initially to try and make um, kids be able to get the opportunity to be coached by a proper coach and to be able to be coached on proper surfaces and infrastructure. And it's been a battle um, and we're still a long way, a long way off. But if we don't start somewhere, then we'll never get to where we want to get to. Of course, and you know, like you spoke like how you were involved with first the Arsenal in India and then uh, you moved on to other various projects. You also involved kindly in the grassroots, you know, like uh, majorly actually. And you also involved, I think, something called the Football Factory. How is the grassroots football, company. you know, that's, like in India? Yeah, well, that's my company. I, I left um, Arsenal uh, after maybe eight months because they were owned by a, a Delhi-based company also. Um, so I, I, I started my own um, and I wanted to give my kids the best of what I could give them whether that's with training facilities, football kits, even balls, everything that I tried to do was to make them realize that this is the way it should be done. Not training on, on pitches that have stones all over the place and dog muck and, you know, all of that. I wanted them to, I wanted them to, to, cause I spoke to a lot of their parents before and they would say to me, oh, we used to have it like that. And I used to say to them, it wasn't right then. And it's certainly not right now. So I wanted these kids to have an opportunity to showcase what they can do, but also for them to to understand what is required from a, from a level. So I'm coming from a European background where and a footballing background where football pitches are the norm. They have grass on, they're flat, and they they're okay, and they, and you can train on. To actually get a football pitch in Goa, in India, or I've I've lived in. Delhi, I've lived in Surat, 
I've lived in Goa, I've seen a lot in Mumbai. So I understand there's a, there's a, there's a lack of space, I get that. But also there's a, there's a dearth of, of, of good, really good football pitches for anybody to go on, not just the rich people and not just the middle class, for every, every form of, of the whole society to be able to go. Because let me tell you now, and I'm, I'm coming from here where I'll say that Indian football is a million miles away at the moment from being in the likes of England, Germany, Brazil, and all of that, okay? But I, I, I also want the kids to be able to have a, an opportunity to look at that and think, that's what I want to get to. And what do we need in order to get there? So A, we need good facilities, we need good football pitches. B, we need good trainers, good coaches who are qualified. Not coaches that have played football, not coaches that have been the captain of their state teams. They have to go and be qualified to a level that is good. And then the third and final one would be the schools. The schools have to embrace sport, whether it's football, cricket, tennis, whatever it is, they need to embrace it, not leave it so low down on the list of things to do. Sport is vitally important in everybody's life, or it should be, because if, you, if you're a healthy, athletic um, young man or young woman, forget about everything else. In your mental phases, you're going to be a lot stronger, a lot more active, a lot more um, be able to retain more information by being fit. So there's no downsides to it. But I see from a lot of what I've, I've noticed, and I've been to an awful lot of schools, they don't, they don't do sport the way it should be done. It's just a sideshow. It might be 40 minutes, get a ball, throw it on a pitch, and 20 versus 20 or... 40 versus 40 people just running around having a bit of fun and then going back in i want to make it i want to make it so um it's accessible to everybody and we have as i said before we have in india right now five lionel messies right now but we don't know where they are and they're not getting the opportunity to showcase that and that's the sad thing for me is that you know they everybody in, in from my expectations in india they get to a level where maybe 12, 13, 14, and then all of a sudden, A, the parents, the pressure from the parents and the schools is to forget everything and just go down the educational route. We can only have so many accountants. We can only have so many doctors. We can only have so many chartered surveyors or whatever it is. Now, there's an opportunity now to, to look at a different way, a holistic way of saying, okay, if you are good at football, Let's pursue that. Still get your education. Like, like it works in, in Europe, everybody still gets educated. It doesn't all stop you at 15, 16. And, but you don't have to be, for me, you don't have to be a topper. You have to be a reasonable adult, 70 percenter, 75 percent, whatever it is, to be a functioning adult. But if you've got a skill set, like being a footballer or like being a good musician or like being a good artist, you can still earn a lot more money or equal amounts of money as you could ever do being a doctor or an accountant or a, a chartered surveyor or whatever it is and this is what i want to try and try and give to the parents a lot of parents are getting it now especially in india because 60 percent of the population are under 30. so that's an awful lot of people who have had opportunity to look at the internet have opportunity to look at what it's like in other in other countries and how they want to be or seem to be doing it. Um, so yeah, that's and that comes back to the question about why India, because I think it's such a, a broad canvas at the moment to, if they just, from my point of view, if whoever's in the charge, whether it's in the footballing, whether it's the AIFFF or whoever it is, and they put a little bit of thought and a little bit of money uh, into it, it can go an awful long way to, to making sport better. And on the last part of this, I'm sorry to go on, but when India won the World Cup cricket in, in the first time, the euphoria in India was unbelievable. Everybody was happy and jolly. The, probably the work rate went up, the birth rate went up, no doubt. Everything went up. And we've got to get that in the football, in sport. We're seeing it now with uh, badminton. We're getting silver medals. We're getting gold medals in boxing. We're doing all of these things, 
sport is vitally important and it's it's been a major part of my life and I'm trying to impart that to to kids going forward and parents also of course and you like that was very detailed and I wanted to ask I have many segues uh, segues from this push from the answer that you gave and I wanted to ask you the first thing you said like you know like nowadays people are more aware and uh, because maybe they are young and they are exposed to other different cultures they kind of are more accepting of the different uh, professions you know like compared to the stereotypical maybe lawyer engineer doctor which still happens which is not bad but it still happens but i mean like don't you think like that is also something to do with isl because now people know there is somewhere to go to where previously they were not sure absolutely and there should be a league below the isl that is a is is a, a feeder league towards the isl so the young kids can play in that level and if they're any good and and also we need in the isl a promotion and a relegation which they don't have at the moment but the the you know the when they did the isl it was great and they got all the big names in now's the time to not get all the big names in and to start coaching the youngsters and they all have grassroots programs but not very not very uh, vociferous with it it's just to tick the boxes and a lot of the money is going to the apex of of the ISL which means to all the players it's not trickling down to like the rural areas in goa or the rural areas in mumbai or the rural areas in in delhi it's not getting there at the moment and it's still now people have to come to a soccer school like mine and have to pay i wanted to get to a stage where no kid has to pay um they come and they get coached by a coach and it 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 would self fund itself but it's very difficult um because you have to be involved with the either in goa it's the local panchayats which is a level of of government if you like then you have the the, the central government uh, the the local government and then obviously the central government and there's so many hur- hurdles and obstacles you have to come from a foreigner's point of view to a get a football pitch so i have to get a football pitch i have to identify one which is good enough then i have to speak to the local panchayat then i have to speak to the local sarpanch then we have to start talking about money and then so on and so forth and it acts every year and it's it's a struggle and um, and i had an indian business partner and um, she she was from delhi um and that made it a little bit easier but we've got to get we've got to make sure that it's for the right reasons i i wanted to come here and i wanted to develop indian kids to be able to go to the isl the isl wasn't that round then when i first came here but that's a good option because i can now say to the parents and i know a lot of the players in the isl robin singh's a good friend of mine who's now uh, just out of the isl um and there's there's a lot of money to be made and i and i say to these uh, the parents they'll say oh that's only a short career i understand that but what i then say to their parents if your child is good enough at 16 17 he'll earn more in one month than your other son who's a, a doctor will earn in his lifetime if he's good enough so when you look at the the money that are involved in the ISL you're looking at maybe 2 3 4 5 and above crore per year for players that they learn that and then if you if they're really good and they go to Europe and play for let's say Man United they could earn a crore a week they could earn 5 crore a week like Sanchez was earning that's mind boggling and i we've got to change the concept where it's it is okay to have a to have a career in football it is okay to be a musician it is okay to be an artist and we've got a change and that's only going to change unfortunately or fortunately when our grandparents and our parents are no longer as as specific and that's not their fault don't get me wrong because that's the society that we we've lived in and it's very much a patriarchal society where the the older the oldest member of the family will make all the decisions for everybody now we've got this situation where we have the parents who are not millennial probably millennials aren't they where they understand how it works so that in in other places and they want their and so there's a balance between not upsetting granddad and not upsetting mum and dad but making sure that your child has the opportunities to do what he wants 
that you never were ever, ever able to do. You've no idea how many parents that I speak to have said to me, I got told to stop. I wanted to be this and I got told to stop and I went ahead with it and I'm going to give my son, or I'm going to give my daughter the opportunity too. And then the crux of all of that is when they get to 15, that's when it all, you know, I I've got to go and do that educate. And that's when it falls down for me. But if there's an option for them to go and play for, I don't know, Bangalore under 19s or Delhi under 18s, 19s, and then progress into the the I League, which, which it was, um, and then into the ISL, and then hopefully then into Europe and, and play at the top, top level. I used to always say to my kids, reach for the stars, not the moon. If you, if, you, if you miss the moon, you're going to reach the stars. If you don't get to the stars, you'll land on the moon, which means don't look to go and play in the ISL. Look to go and play in the Champions League for Real Madrid. If that's your goal, if you don't get there, fine. Have that aspiration. If you don't get there and you land on the moon, which is you go and play in the ISL, it's still a really good standard and it's still able to earn a good living to be able to provide not only for themselves, but for the, the family and the mothers and the fathers and the and so I want that to change. It's very difficult, I know, and I'm not going to change it because I'm just one voice. Um, but I know from speaking to you guys, your age groups, and when you have kids, I know it's going to be different. I know the uh, the the mindset is going to be different. I'm sure from your point of view, um, I know you're doing this and you obviously love your sport and. And this is another avenue. I mean, I, the two guys who work with us are Pitt and Manas. Manas was a very, 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 very good cricketer, really good cricketer, and couldn't do it because he had to do his exams. And our Pitt was an engineer. He's, 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 a, he's a qualified engineer and hated it. And they both quit what they were doing. And now they went into this for football or sports as it is and they've made a, a living for themselves a good living for themselves doing something that is so outside the box and we've got to give the kids the opportunity to to at least try that um, and there's that balance i understand it's it's a big balance I'm a, I'm a father of three you know what i mean and i understand that you want the best for your kids uh, but you've also got to teach them that it's important to have good qualifications and everything else so it's a balance that I, I I know what I want to do with it, but I can't implement it. So it's it's it gets frustrating at times. Of course, and you know, before we move on, I have, I have a lot of questions from that. I'm also an engineer. Well, there you go. And and don't get me wrong, that's great because it shows that you're very a very intelligent lad. But the fact that you want to do stuff like this tells me that that's not your passion. This is your passion, and. Let me tell you from my point of view, I've, I'm the luckiest man alive. You know, I've, from the age of five, I wanted to be a footballer. And I have been in football all of my life. I'm 54, coming up to 54 now. And I'm still working in football, albeit on the TV, talking about football. I'm the luckiest man. That's my passion. So I don't see it as a job. I see it just as a... I don't know. It's it's great, isn't it? Because if I wasn't talking on the TV, I'd be talking with my friends in a bar watching the football. So I'm, um, so yeah. And and when it's a passion and it's a love, you'll do anything to you'll 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 put ten hours more in just to get through to where you want to get to. Um. So yeah, I'm not and I'm not decrying. I'm not debasing the likes of people who are engineers. I think it's great. Uh. But. I, I know an awful lot of engineers who have got the qualifications and they're all doing totally different things. You know, um, some are businessmen and some are uh, obviously the likes of Arpit is a presenter. And so there's lots of jobs out there now that weren't out there when mum and dad were around. Um, and the world is changing now. You know what I mean? It's it's not going to be a based on all of that. There's going to be so many more more opportunities for different types of jobs. You know, if you look at the Middle East, they're not investing in, in anything other than leisure and tourism now, because they see that as being the next big thing. Um, and so we've got to we've got to think, you know, for our kids especially, just be, just try. If you've got someone in your family or one of your children loves what he does, just let him carry on, carry on, and carry on. 
because he'll try 10 times harder, you know, and I'm sure, again, I'm sorry to go on, but I, I see parents, it, it, and also this is a big thing in India especially, and more so in Goa, we have the monsoons. So training here stops because there's no facilities, there's no indoor facilities. So you've got a child here in India, you have a child here in the UK. This child's five and this child's five. Now fast forward to 16, 11 years, okay? This child on the left from England will have had 11 years, well, three months every year times 11, more coaching than this kid will have. And then throw in the exams, which is another month. So this kid is not going to be coached for four months of the year. It's a lot of time. So how are we ever going to bridge, bridge that gap? So all of these things are intermingled in terms of getting back to what we, we were talking about with the grassroots and stuff. We need infrastructure. We need indoor facilities to be able to go through the monsoons, you know, and, and give these kids the opportunity to develop that way. So yeah, it's 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 there's loads of things that need to change. It's very difficult. It's like a it's like the Titanic. It takes a long time for it to turn around and it's gotta be a gradual process. Of course, like I have one final question related to this grass too. I wanted to ask you uh, in terms of this uh, matter of, you know, like how maybe parents are not uh, supportive, you know, like at least in the past generation. But don't you think that is also because when they were kind of making the decisions for us, maybe that opportunity or that, you know, that uh, they didn't see the end goal, basically what I meant to say, like maybe engineering was a lot thing. Yeah, no, but again, uh, there wasn't an end for them to see because there was no ISL. There was no, there wasn't any sort of progress. It was the I League, and obviously people weren't earning that much money in the I League, and and so yeah, they they were erring on the side. Of, I'm not I, I'm not having a go at parents because it's an, an unenviable position. They want the best for their child. They want them to be educated as 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 highly as they can be. And then they want them to go out and, and live a good life and be able to look after everybody. And I get all of that. But you can't have that anymore in terms of in your mindset because you know what's out there. You know what can be achieved. So there's no excuse for this generation, your generation, to keep going. With the, listen, you've got to be very respectful of your, your, of your parents and your grandparents, absolutely. And they will say a lot of things to you that you will do but you don't have to do everything. Do you know what I'm saying? And then your child then will look at you and think, well, he didn't actually do everything that granddad wanted or what mummy wanted. Now I can be like that. And maybe in a couple of generations time, kids will be able to make decisions basically for themselves. And what we fail to, to, to do in all of this, these kids, you know, all of our kids, I remember mine growing up, you know, and me growing up, my parents would say to me, just sit there, don't speak until you're spoken to, okay? I had so much to want to talk about at two, five, six, seven, eight, I'm bursting. And we take all of that out of the kids. I'm not saying it's it happens here, but where I was from, that was it. I would go to see my grandparents and it'd be, sit down, don't say anything until you're spoken to. So I'd go to my grandparents, I'd be like, and I wouldn't say a thing. And he had all of these things bursting out of, my, out of my brain. And so when I was a father, I never did that. I changed it. And I was very respectful to my parents, but also in my own home, they, I, I fathered and, and, and did what I had to do from my point of view. And I think the way it's going now, it's getting better, especially in India, the kids are getting more independent or a lot more independent because the scene, as you say, they're open to all of these other cultures all of these and i'm not saying you know go from being an indian culture to an american culture because that 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 shouldn't happen but there's got to be a balance between everything i i look at the indian culture and i take a lot of what they have and i think wow that's great but similarly i look at it i'll think oh don't want none of that and the same with you with my culture you'll think oh some of that's good oh i don't want none of that and then we can rather than it just be all being banged down on us from a height which is I did it because my parents told me and you're going to do it because they told me and it was the right thing to do. It's not always the right thing. Of course, I knew like uh, you worked with Arsenal in your first stint, at least in India in the beginning. So I had this, I think it might be a very weird question, but I wanted to ask you like you have a lot of this 
big name teams coming like Boca Juniors or maybe PSG who have this kind of academies all over India. At least when I was in Bangalore, I saw a lot of them. Do you think that's a marketing gimmick instead of them Absolutely. actually wanting anything else like to develop something? Well, that's the reason I left. I left Arsenal Soccer Schools because it was owned by a Delhi-based company and they bought the rights to name themselves as Arsenal. I thought naively that I would come here and I would, you know, have everything from Arsenal to be able to, you know, get a nice pitch, get a this, get a that. And, very, and I very much realised very quickly that it was more of a, uh, a brand. It was very much a branding opportunity. And don't get me wrong, it was right for them to try and because that would get the kids to be able to come to their soccer school. So it was very much a money-making exercise rather than a developmental exercise, which is what I wanted was the developmental side of it. And I lasted eight months with, with, with the company that I came to work with. And um, and then I decided to, to do my own because I, I, I realized that it had a lot of potential. I had centers in Delhi. And then we moved, we went to Gujarat, I went to Surat, and we had three centers there, which were doing really well. And then the, 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 the places we were using realized that we were doing really, really well and then wanted to do it themselves. And then they threw us out and, and so on. And, so, and you're laughing, so the, obviously this has happened on lots of occasions. And everywhere we went, we would get lots of kids because, and I'll go back to the point of what I was saying about coaching, because I was giving them quality coaching, which they've never, ever seen or had before. You know, I, I, and I was giving them um, avenues and pathways that if they were good enough with all of my contacts back in the UK, I could have got them a trial at any football club if they were good enough and they had to be good enough to do that. So that was the onus is on me to coach them in the right way, uh, to give them all of the basics. I used to say to them and they, they would go away and watch Ronaldo do an overhead kick and I'd say, great but you've got to be able to control the ball and pass the ball. So a lot of ours was getting the basics done and then we were going to build on, on that. But as I say, every turn I went, it became more and more of an obstacle. It was either the fact that I was a foreigner out in, inside um, and I was maybe taking someone else's job or, you know, they seen that we were, were doing okay and then we were putting the prices of the football pitches up and so on and so forth. And in the end, um, it became untenable for me to be able just to, I just wanted to go out and enjoy what I was doing. And it was becoming a bit of a minefield in terms of trying to get the infrastructure sorted. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a lot better now than when I first came, that, that, that's for sure. And Bangalore, which you, you, you know, has an awful lot of academies. Um, and that's basically the hub and the center of most of the academies in, in, in India. Uh, and they try and do it well. You know, but Bangalore UFC have a really robust grassroots program. Um, and that's basically because of the manager they had, which was Ashley Westwood, who's a friend of mine. Uh, he does the television with us. He was the one who made them into a really professional outfit. Uh, and he, he co incorporated everything that he'd learned back in the UK to, to come out here. And, 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 and I'm not saying that the UK is, is, is the best and everything else, but when you come to a place like India where standards aren't that great in terms of acceptance of facilities, acceptance of football pitches, acceptance of coaching qualifications, he was a revelation. No, yeah, the moment I, uh, the reason I got this question was, you, okay, you, you can understand if you have a team like PSG or Arsenal, like you said, you know, like they are more renowned all over the world. Then maybe you have Boca Juniors, like Boca Juniors is a very big club in its own right. But you don't expect their academy to be in India. I mean, like, well, what you've got to realize is it wasn't Boca Juniors and Barcelona. It's not actually Barcelona that are coming here. It's FC Ebola, um, and they're using the, the name Barcelona. Are to a, to a point are part of the Barcelona Football Club, um, but there's not. If you're good at the FC, uh, is it Escola here? It's not a ball. Escola, I think it's called. They won't automatically go to Barcelona's football club if they're very good. They'll have to go through different means to get there. But having said all of that, all of these clubs, the one thing that every club in every part of the world, whether it's South America, North America, Europe, anywhere wants, is an Indian footballer. An Indian footballer good enough to play 
in their team. We've seen it with the likes of Son at Tottenham for South Korea. We've seen it with Park, do you see whatever his name, member Park, who played for Manchester United. We've seen it with lots of, lots of uh, players. The one thing that everyone wants is an Indian player because if you get, I don't know, let's say Virat Kohli as a footballer playing for Manchester United, Manchester United are going to have 1.3 billion supporters straight away, aren't they? Because everyone in India will automatically gravitate to, to this player. and So that's what they want. And this is why they come, is to try and get a foothold into um, whatever. And then it's, it's a very difficult place to come. I mean, Man United have been here and left. It's just a really uh, difficult... Man City have come now to Mumbai also. So that'll be interesting to see how they, they go about it with their monies and, and let's see what the facilities are going to be like in Mumbai. Um, so it, it's getting better. It really is getting better, but uh, there's an awful, awful long way to go. But like, you know, like the city group, like, like if you come as a, as a club itself, it will be difficult, but city group invested in Mumbai city. So they have like, you have a pathway that, you know, okay, you can end up with Mumbai city in the ISL. Like they don't sell you the dream of maybe you will play in uh, the Premier League. No, but if you're good enough, this is my point. Now, the standard of coaching at Mumbai City will go through the roof now because Manchester City will get A, the people that are there more qualified and get them the exposure to go and coach in maybe, in, in maybe England or in one of the other franchises that they own. So that's going to benefit whoever comes through the, the doors, whether it's kids or whether it's footballers. Um, and also, it's given these, these, these kids a pathway. If they're good enough and they're playing for the ISL at 16, 17, 18, whatever it is, and they're doing really well, yes, they'll go and have a trial at Manchester City. And yes, they will hopefully sign it. We've got to get one kid to go and be that, but there's an awful long way to go before that. It's like going into school. And when you go into school at four and five and six, you don't take your exams to have a degree, do you? You don't. You have to go through the processes each year. And then when you get to 19, 20, 21, 22, then you take your exams for this, the master's degrees or whatever it is. That's 15 years of training, of coaching. We've got to get that into our kids now. We've got to get them coached at ages three, four, five, six, seven, not at 12 not at 15, get them at that age group, get them loving the game, get them understanding the game, because go back to the, the point I was saying about sitting there in a chair and not being able to speak. Kids between the ages of two and six learn more in them life in, in their four years than they will ever learn in the whole of their lifetime. So these kids are very, very um, like sponges. They'll take everything in. And if you get them to understand what you want them to do at that age, going forward, it's going to be a, a lot easier than it would have been uh, otherwise. Of course, and even like I'll move on from that, you know, like uh, endless topic and endless discussion that we can have about this topic, you know, like uh, I had similar with, uh, you know, Joe Morrison also about similar topic, you know, like uh, about this and he was also very passionate, like how he spoke about it. I'll move to your career, you know, you started, you started your career with Liverpool. How was your time there? It was great. It was, um, it was my boyhood club. Um, my brother was a, a professional there also, and so I gravitated just to sign for Liverpool. I could have signed for a lot of other clubs, but I thought, okay. Um, and I was there from the age of, well, the age of 11 through to 18, 19, um, and played through all of the, uh, the A team, the B team, the reserves, and managed to only play twice for the first team, but... That's my biggest achievement in my football career is being able to play for Liverpool at that time with the amount of quality players. Liverpool at the time was the best club in the world. They had the best team in the world and I was very fortunate to play only two games, but that's the, I mean, I've played in major cup finals. I've represented my country. Uh, I've had promotions and all of this, but that was the biggest achievement was to play for Liverpool. Of course, and you know, like, uh, I wanted to ask you like, Playing maybe getting into a team was quite difficult because that time, like you mentioned, like amazing team way. I think in that space you were there, I think you all won league every year. I think so. Like so, and the Champions League and everything, or the European Cup as it was. It was the best team um, around. I think they won the treble as well. So yeah, very difficult to get in. So like 
how difficult was it like when you realized okay i have to move on from here it was really difficult and the manager was a guy called Kelly Dalglish and he said to me you don't have to leave but i i cuz i'd had a taste of the first team and realized that it might take a lot longer to get back into the first team i wanted to play regularly and i explained that to him and manchester city came in which wasn't as it was now but it was still a huge club at the time and um I thought okay I'll go there and it'll give me the opportunity to to play more regularly um and so I took the plunge if I had the chance to stay again I would have stayed I wouldn't have left Liverpool but I took the chance uh, and I went and I'm, I'm not I mean I say I'm not regretting it I would have changed the decision but I don't regret the fact that I went to Manchester City because it was a, a huge club um and obviously then I went to Bolton and Swindon after that and yeah so it was um I've had a decent career I wasn't the best player in the world but I certainly wasn't the worst player in the world and um I'll, I'm I'm happy that I've had been able to to a bring up three kids three football which is no mean feat because we back in our day we would only be given two year contracts three years at the most so you had to perform to a level to be able to get another contract or for some other club to come in and 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 want to sign you and so yeah it kept you on your toes also so you know like i think this will be a very straightforward answer but you know like you played for multiple you know huge names in terms of the english football where did you enjoy your time the most bolton I enjoyed because I was there for five years, um, and we had lots of success at Bolton. We went from League One or League Two to League One to the Championship, and then finally up to the Premier League. And that was all in in the time space that I was at the club. We we played against Liverpool in the 1995 um, League Cup. Got beat two one when Steve McManaman scored two goals against us. um and then we we beat reading in the playoffs and um, to go up into the premier league and then you know bolton then became a big club i left at that point but bolton became a big club attracting all of these players you know that they were getting um and they they were doing really really well in the premier league and I'm so fortunate the way they are now and they've gone right back down again through financial irregularities and such um but yeah that was my 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 best cuz i i I played an awful lot of games for for Bolton and we had a lot of success. Of course and you like what do you think of uh, like I think Liverpool have come full circle from the time you were there and you saw them winning. Did you expect them to go like in a 30 year period where they'll not win? Absolutely not because I always believed and they're not don't get me wrong but I always believed Liverpool were the biggest club in the world. Patently not the biggest club in the world um but If you look back at the history of Liverpool, especially in the in the European Cup or the Champions League, it's it's very very good. And this is the one thing that, um, as a manager or as a as a supporter or a, as a, a chairman of a football club, the Premier League is 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 the big prize because, you know, it's a long haul. It's thirty eight games, and you you've got to be at your top. And what Liverpool have achieved in the last couple of years, even when they came second to Manchester City. you know to only you know lose one game i think it was all season and and not win it and then they won it the year after convincingly and it looks like they've started again this year on on a really good footing um so yeah i mean 30 years is a long time isn't it to not win uh, a major a major but, but a lot of that is to do with Jurgen Klopp and also to do with the owners the FSG group they they've invested an awful lot of money and they get a bad press a lot of the time because they're not in, injecting as much as people want them to but i think they've done it you know really 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 well and well done because they brought in alison for 60 million he's probably worth more double than that you've got van dijk who's probably worth a lot more you've got salah who's obviously worth a lot more you've got mane as well so their their model and the way they go about it is um is, is the right way for liverpool Of course, I wanted to ask you uh, one. I was saying from that, it's like you know, like you said, like how uh, fans generally criticize them for not investing. But don't you think, like for me at least, I feel they have made the club more sustainable, which is better than maybe investing a lot right now. Because you see, we have an example like Bolton, like you mentioned, 
like they were in the Premier League some years back, and it can get uh, quite messy, you know, like if you don't keep track. This, this is this is the thing, and I and I would sit if I could with these supporters and say, okay, invest a hundred million, two hundred million, five hundred million. Okay, it's not an exact science. Players come and they might be able to play at a club, and then your club is in financial difficulty. Are you going to bail them out? Are you going to say I'm going to give you my house to? So it's it's prudent. It's like when you have your own home. If your bills are one lakh rupees per month, okay, and you earn one point two lakh per month, you're okay. But if your bills are one lakh rupees and you only earn fifty thousand rupees, you're in trouble, aren't you? And you can't rack up them debts year on year and or week in or month in and month out. And so I think with the FSG group, they've done brilliant. They've spent when they had to. They've been really strong uh, when they had to as well by saying no to Werner and no to players like this. You know because they understand that the logic is they have to they have to balance the books, and the books are so much more than. You know, you're talking two and three hundred million a year in wage bills and different things. It's it's crazy the money that they're talking. And you know, and and what happens as well also is this is a thing that a lot of supporters don't realise. If I want to sign you for a hundred million, your wages are going to be a hundred million, near enough over the course of five years. That's reality. So you just don't cost me a hundred million. You cost the club two hundred million. So they've got to, they've got to understand that if and they did it with when um, Torres left, they had fifty million. So we went out and bought um, the left winger and the striker from Suarez and Carroll. Um, yeah, so Suarez w- w- was a good sign and Carroll not so not not so much, but Carroll's wages would have been thirty five million over the course of his that. So that fifty million, you know, you've got to think that's going to be another. Another fifty million on top of that for the wages for both of the players, and and then that's when your budget becomes so so huge, and you've got to work within that budget. So theoretically, they probably only had twenty five million to spend, if you know what I mean. So you know, like so, uh, yeah, it's yeah. Please go ahead. Oh no no no! Like um, I wanted to say, like two of your former teams, like City and Liverpool, are favourites for the title this year. Who do you think will win? I think uh, after watching Man City. Um, and Pep Guardiola, I think Liverpool will will dominate the game because if Man City want to win the the Premier League, they cannot do it with the back four that they have or the back three that they play. Um, he's obviously spent big money on getting Diaz in, um, but I'm not sure whether that is is enough because defensively they're absolutely dreadful. And it's all well and good having the firepower that they do have. But if you've got to score six goals to win a game, then that's not right. And and with all due respect to Pep, he spent nearly 250 million plus on defenders who can't defend. So John Stones, 50 million, can't defend. Very nice on the ball, looks silky. You know, Otamendi can't defend. Now he's he's brought in Ruben Diaz, who is very nice and silky on the ball. The, 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 The... the jury will be out to see how we can defend, especially in, in the Premier League where it's so hectic, it's so quick, it's so, um, you know, you've got to be really tough strength-wise. And, you know, if you look at the front line of Liverpool with uh, Mane, Salah um, and Firmino, you know, the, these guys can't live with um, the defenders can't live with them. So that's what he needs to do. Forget about scoring six goals. Keep a clean sheet, and then that will get you to win the champions, uh, the championship, and the Champions League, for instance, too. So you know, like I read somewhere or I watched a video. I don't know. I saw that you know, like none of the previous City managers have gone two seasons without winning a title, like since the takeover and the major they started winning. So do you think like there's a small chance of him getting sacked? If they don't win, no. Listen, he hasn't won the, the Premier League and he hasn't won the Champions League, but he still won trophies. You know, they're still in there with, you know, for the the League Cups, the FA Cups, the whatever it is. Um, they are the best team on their day, absolutely guaranteed. But as we've seen in the last couple of seasons, they're very inconsistent at the moment. And you know, your bedrock for me as a, as a football team has got to be your defence. If your defence is strong and solid. Everything else that goes in front of you is a bonus. 
and what they have in front of them is the best bonus you could possibly have. You know, Sterling, De Bruyne, Mares. You know, you've got so many quality players. You know, Jesus. You've got Aguero, who's obviously not fit. You've got loads of players to get them to score goals, but they don't seem to be able to to keep a clean sheet. And you know, as much as scoring's great, it's amount the amount of goals that you don't concede, which is which is everything. You know, like I just wanted to ask one more question related to that. Do you think, like, would you take anyone from City's team in the Liverpool front line? I'd have Sterling, but not for any of the of the front three of Liverpool. I'd add, I'd try and add him to it as a bench player. I'd have Ster- well, this is the problem now, you see, because if you bring in, say, Werner comes to the club, where does he go? He's not going to be. He's not going to take the place of any of them. So it's a difficult situation for managers to to get these top players in. They've got to be better than what you have, and then they can be justified by bringing them in and be justified by dropping one of the front three. It's a difficult equation, and that's probably why he hasn't gone out and got a top, top, top class striker, um, because he realises that will cause an awful lot of unrest within the camp. You know, even Thiago coming in has ruffled a few feathers because we didn't really need Thiago. I'm a Liverpool supporter, and I'm saying as, as, as a supporter, we didn't really desperately need Thiago to come. He's great, don't get me wrong, and for 30 million, it's been a steal. But we didn't need him. We had adequate players in there for Bino, Keita, um, Henderson, uh, Wijnaldum. We had all of these players. So that causes a bit of unrest because players will think, hang on then, what I've done for you, say for instance, Henderson, you know, in all due respect, he's nowhere near the player that Steven Gerrard is. But he's won more silverware. Or as many. He's uh, a better the, captain, you can say. Better that. captain, yeah. So, um, and this is the balance as a manager. You want the best, and this is when supporters need to be really, really um, clear on this. Is that you know, be careful what you wish for, because say for instance, they had got Werner in the club. You've got to play him. You have to play him because you've spent sixty odd million on him. You've got to play him, and that might then, you know. The, the equilibrium of the football club, especially the forwards, that mightn't be that mightn't have been the right right decision. And they took that decision, got criticised for it. But you know, he hasn't pulled up any trees at Chelsea, has he? Werner at the moment. Of course, and even I, I I completely understand why Werner didn't they didn't go for him because it didn't make sense. Like even stylistically, whom would he replace in the team? Like you know, like we have Minamino. Maybe in the future he might might uh, you know be a player of. Like how Roberto Firmino is, but it goes back to my point: is that you bought him for thirteen million or seven million, whatever it was. That's okay. He's expected to sit on the bench. He knows that, and he's going to come in and play. But if you'd have bought Minamino for seventy-five million, he's not coming to sit on the bench. If you're spending seventy-five million on a player, he's got to be better than what you what you have. Of course, and, and he's also a very good marketing tool. Well, yes, but having, but it, you still got to. It's, it's all of this marketing and branding is all well and good. You've got to have a team on the pitch to be able to brand it and market it. Um, and this is where Klopp's been very, very good. He's got together a team, not individuals. He's got together a team, and he's been lucky because all of the grumblings within the football club stay. Just as a little bit of a grumble because the winning stuff, the winning. When you when you see a club disintegrate, like we've seen a little bit with Tottenham last year, we've seen it with Man United over the years, where stories are coming out the club saying Pogba's not happy and they've had a fight over here and they've had a fight over there and training and all of it. Nothing comes out of Liverpool because the winning stuff. As soon as that stops and they have a little bit of a tricky period, then players and agents will start getting a little bit. You know, and and they'll fight with each other on the training ground, which is a normal thing to do. That used to happen when I used to train every single day. Someone would have a bust up with each other, you know, and that's natural. That's good. That's healthy. Um, but when the stories come out, that's not healthy, and then that becomes a big issue for the club, the the, the manager, and then you'll see an an implosion, like we've seen at, at other clubs, Man United, as we've said, and.
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. So you know, like as as a player, you know, like this might be a very difficult question. Yeah, as you as you played for both the teams, whom would you prefer to play under, Klopp or Guardiola? Oh, Klopp all day long. All day long, Klopp, and twice on a Sunday. I would. I think he's what he's done because I'm a Liverpool lad. I'm a scouser, as they call us, from Liverpool. He is the embodiment of of that. He he understands the the city. He understands the people. Um, we're work, we're hard working class people. Um, we no nonsense. We don't take any rubbish in terms of the blarney that that other manager have in the past. Um, the likes of Brendan Rodgers used to treat the, the Liverpool supporters as though they were stupid, and they're not. They're very they're a very intellectual bunch of people, especially on football. They know because they've had the best, and they realise you know now they've got the best again, if you like. And in between has been a bit of a mismatch, you know. And the, you can't pull the wool over their eyes. So I think Klopp's come in. He's the nearest thing to a guy called Bill Shankly that the club have, have, has had. Uh, Ken Dalglish was a good manager. Bob Paisley and Joe Fagan was a good manager also. All won trophies. But Klopp is is the embodiment of of Bill Shankly and. Um, that the supporters love him, the players play for him, which is the most important thing. And when you're a manager of a club, of a football club, it's not about coaching. It's about managing. You're managing men. You are managing egos. They've all got egos. We all have egos. How can you manage? How many is in the squad? 25? So there's 25 players in the squad. All millionaires, all earning good monies. How, how do you work it? Because how, how many players can play on a Saturday? 11. So you've got 15 or 17 players that are going to be unhappy. And as a manager, they're the ones that you've got to manage. You've got to be able to say, okay, you know, and, and build it through that way. And that's when, you, if you win games, it's easier to deal with that because the players have no, no comeback with it. But when they're losing and they're not getting the game, then all of a sudden it becomes a big issue. And that's where... Klopp has got them all on side um, and they're all in the right direction. It, it took them a couple of years to get them to what he wanted to get to in terms of fitness and how they wanted to play. The high tempo, high press. Um, but when, they, when they've when they got there, my goodness, we've seen that in the last two years, haven't we, what, what can be achieved? Of course, and you know, like the next question may be more you know, hypothetical and I wanted to ask you because you have been around the situation, you know, in the in Anfield and uh, Liverpool especially, do you think like if Klopp stays on at Liverpool, he has the potential to over, you know, over you know like uh, power the likes of Bill Shankly and uh, Bob Paisley? It's, it's a big ask because they won a lot of trophies. They won the European Cups and uh, you know their their trophy, uh, especially Bob Paisley's, is is phenomenal. Um, I think the game's changed in respect of managers having shelf lives. I know Klopp has said he only wants to stay on another year or two and then move on. And you've got to be careful that you don't outstay your welcome, if you like, you know. And he'll know when the time is right to leave because he knows he can't take them any further. There's only so much you can do, absolutely. And he's getting, if, if, if the percentage bar is zero to 100, he's getting 90 Five to 97% out of his players every week and there's only so much he can get to before he actually thinks I can't I can't go any better than this so you know I might have to bow out on the top so it's not about um, it's not about making or winning as many trophies as the other guys it's the impact they have on the club and the impact that he has had on the club has been equally as much as what Bill Shankly did Bill Shankly put Liverpool where they were and where they are now Klopp after 30 years of not mismanagement but you know mediocre football to a certain extent Klopp has got them back to that level where Liverpool are now a club to want to go to i.e. Thiago could have gone anywhere but he chose Liverpool not because of anything other than the fact that Klopp was there the club the, the fact that they played a really good high intensive uh, game and the Champions League winners and the Premier League winners and it's a club to want to go to and also from a purely uh, partisan point of view, 
Liverpool is a great city to live in as well. And it's, you know, the people in Liverpool are really humble and really honest and, and caring. Um, and it's a brilliant city to be in also. So all of them things, but the main thing is club. And that's what attracts, you know, players to, to your football club is the manager and, and also the team and how they're doing. Of course, and you like, uh, I'll wrap it up with one final question. We can go on and on, you know, talk about many stuff, but I'll ask you one final question. You have had so much experience as a player and also as a manager, you said you manage in a lot of things. If you had to give a piece of advice to a young player and also a young manager, what advice would you give them? To a young player yeah. is yeah. practice, listen, learn, practice, listen, learn, practice, practice, practice. And, and we talked about this before and love what you do. If you don't love it, you'll never get to where you get to. And we had a, at my soccer school, we had a, um, a thing where you had to have these certain, it's called a star program, we called it. So S was for self-esteem, T was for timekeeping, A was for attitude, R was for respect, and T was for teamwork. If you can't inculcate all of them skill sets into you as a human being, you'll never reach to where you need to get to. So it's an interesting one. Self-esteem is the most important thing. If you don't think you're good enough, nobody else is going to think you're good enough. So you've got to have that dream and then you've got to work hard and hard work as well. You've got to really work hard. But them five elements for me, not, not even just for football, for life in general, if you go into a working environment in an office, you know, You've got to have teamwork. You've got to have timekeeping. You've got to have an attitude. You've got to respect the people you're working with. And then you've still got to love yourself and you've got to love everyone around you. And that, for me, is the, is the key. And we try to inculcate them into all of the kids. Not one of them is to do with technical ability in football. It's all about the person themselves. And if you see the top players, the top players all have that. They all have respect for themselves, for their teammates. You look at Ronaldo now. He loves himself. Self-esteem is huge. He'll never be late for anything. His attitude is, and commitment is, is second to none. He respects himself and respects everyone around him. And he's part of a team. He works hard for the team. Even though he's the best player in the world or one of the best players in the world, he still works within the team system. And that's what you've got to do. And for a coach, also I would suggest for a coach is different. You've got, to, you've got to be dedicated to what you do. You've got to be organized. You've got your plans and your sessions have to be organized and disciplined. And you've got to be able to, to give to the players um, all of your knowledge and make sure they can understand that and, and also work hard on it. You know, it's, there's, there's no easy way in life. And as much as people say to me, you know, it's smart work, I'd rather have someone who's hard working than smart working because I know the smart work only lasts for so long and then you've got to get back to it. So all of these, they're not rocket science. It's like for every, every what, if you want to be the best engineer in the world, it's not just going to happen like that for you. You've got to work hard at it, haven't you? You know, and it's the same with, with, with football, but for kids, especially practice, they should get up in the morning with a football in the hand and they should go to bed with a football in the hand and in between practice, in between homeworks and doing whatever, Go and practice. What the coach has told you to do, try and practice. Like we all did, we all used to go out onto the streets and play and practice against the wall, just kicking a ball. You know, it's, it sounds boring as anything, and it probably is. But you'll become a footballer because it's the repetition and, and the cognitive thing of, of the repetition. And yeah, so that's what I would, I would suggest. It's not, it's not a sexy thing. It's hard work and, um, you know, even for Ronaldo and Messi, it doesn't come easy. They have to work 100% every single day at it. Of course, and you, of course, that's a lot, very true. And you like on that note, Mark, thank you so much for talking to me. And I wish you all the best for your future endeavors, be it Ponditri or hope you can produce more players who go on to play maybe for Liverpool and make them Hopefully. Champions League and make them win it. You never know. That's, that's the key. And do you know what? If I, if I have any sort of little imprint on that by being over here through the coaching, that's all I can ask for. It's not going to happen in the next year or two. It's going to be a long old haul, but we will get there. Of course. And I hope so. And uh, hope we can talk again soon. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Okay. See you later. Bye.